James Marshall Hendricks was born in Seattle in 1942. His parents were divorced eight years later, and his mother died in 1958. His father bought him his first guitar for $5 when he was 11, and as a teenager, he played in lots of local Seattle bands. But in 1961, Jimmy decided he needed to change his life. He joined the Army and enlisted in the 101st Airborne Division. He was stationed in Kentucky, a place with a much larger black population than Seattle. And it was here that he really came to know and loved the blues. He spent a lot of time in black clubs, listening and learning, and then started his own band, The Casuals. After less than two years in the Army, he damaged his back during a parachute jump and was discharged. Rather than go back to Seattle, he settled in Nashville and started playing what was known as the Chitlin Circuit, a network of black clubs and bars. He spent the next three years traveling around the South, playing with whoever would take him on, Little Richard, Sam Cooke, Jackie Wilson, and B.B. King. But these bands were anything but his natural home. His love of the blues was considered deeply unfashionable amongst his contemporaries. Black American musicians thought of themselves as having moved on. Their talents were employed elsewhere in modern, slick soul and R&B. African American musicians would dress up to the absolute nines because in their working lives, they were probably, whether they worked in a factory or on a farm, they were probably wearing overalls to dress up for the stage or for church was a way of escaping upwards. Charles Shaw Murray is a music journalist and has written a biography of Hendrix. Hendrix, I don't think he ever even owned a suit until he got wealthy, but when he was playing during his brief periods as a sideman for well-known soul musicians, he's supposed to wear a uniform, which he could not stand. The uniform would be a mohair suit. One band he was in, he said, you even got fined if you had the wrong colour shoelaces. Soul music is very precise. You know, there's very little improvisation in it except by the leader, who's usually the singer. Every step, synchronised steps, have to be in place. Every note, every lick, every riff, in place. Hendrix uh, was a, an improviser and a show-off, and Hendrix did, really didn't fit into that. Most of the bands he was in found him difficult or just plain odd. He was very shy, often late, and played his guitar in a way that didn't fit into their way of doing things. Not only that, he was developing a flamboyant personal style that kept getting him into trouble. Graham Nash from Crosby, Stills & Nash came across Jimmy very early on. And I played with Jimmy when he was in Little Richard's band, way before he became Jimi Hendrix. And he was spectacular then. I re remember all too clearly being in the um, Paramount Theatre in Times Square where, where we were doing this show. There's an elevator right backstage that comes off the stage and the elevator went up all the floors to the dressing rooms. And Little Richard is screaming at his guitar player, who are you to upstage me? I'm Little Richard, you mofo. Dad. Don't you ever play guitar with your teeth again? That was Jimmy. And nobody upstage is Little Richard. In 1964, Jimmy moved to New York and was taken on by the Isley Brothers. Ronnie Isley actually had to buy him some guitar strings so he could do the audition. But he was still just a part of a backing band, and he left after eight months. He started hanging out in Greenwich Village, where a much more eclectic taste in music was not just tolerated, but actively encouraged. This was where he came across British bands like The Who and The Yardbirds, the new jazz, John Coltrane and Ornette Coleman, and perhaps most inspiring to him, Bob Dylan. And it was in the village that he got together his own band, Jimmy James and the Blue Flames, and they had a regular gig at the Café Wah. It was the summer of 1966, and Chaz Chandler was also in New York, touring with the Animals. I went to New York about a week in front of the, the Last Animals tour and saw a girlfriend of mine in New York, and this is... The, actually the truth, she played me a rank, I went to her place and she played me a rank with my Tim Rose called Hey Joe. And I said to myself, well, when I get back to the end of this tour, I'm going to find an artist and I'm going to record this. The next night, I bumped into Linda Keith, who was Keith Richards' girlfriend in them days, and was a good pal of ours. And she says, hey, I've come across this guy in Greenwich Village, you must see, I hear you're going to go into record production. She, you know, she knew through the grapevine that we're breaking up. And uh, she says, you should see this guy. So I went down to see him the following afternoon at the Café War in, in Greenwich Village. 
And the first song he played was Hey Joe. And you know, just about, that's it, I don't look anymore. We, we sat and talked for about two hours. This was in about July. Our tour of America was finishing in September, late September. I said, I'll come straight back to New York, pick you up and take you to London. And he said, I'll be here. Yeah. And that's how I met Hendrix. I just sat there, I thought to myself, uh, well, there's got to be a catch here somewhere because somebody must have signed him up years ago, sort of thing, you know? I just couldn't believe that this guy was standing around and nobody was doing anything for him, you know? He was just stunning. So, a month later, Chaz returned to New York, picked Jimmy up and headed for Britain. In retrospect, the move to London seems obvious, but actually it was a leap in the dark. He didn't know anybody there, he had no fixed job, and he had no money. Charles Murray. I mean, his attitude was, well, I starved all the way across the United States, I may as well go starve in England. And he arrived in England with a guitar, the rollers that he used to curl his, curl his hair, and a jar of face cream for his acne. He arrived broke. He, you know, cast his bread on the waters, so to speak. He'd tried everything he could think of to get recognised in the States. And even though, you know, he'd been seen playing in, the, in Greenwich Village by people like Miles Davis had seen him, I think Dylan saw him play, you know, nobody was sort of saying, OK, here's a career, you know. He arrived in London on the morning of September the 24th, 1966. That same night, he played his first gig and was introduced to Cathy Etchingham, a friend of Chaz Chandler's. Jimmy was sitting with Linda Keith and Linda Keith went to the ladies or went somewhere and Jimmy called me over and I sat where she'd been sitting and we started talking. When she came back, she somehow got into an argument with Ronnie Money and Ronnie, being from the Gorbals, <laughs> Scottish dynamite, objected to what she'd said and was protective about me and some sort of fight broke out. Plates were being flung around and everything. And Chas said to me, get Jimmy back to the Hyde Park Towers Hotel. It's in Inverness Terrace. So we went out and we walked up to Piccadilly and I saw the taxi coming and Jimmy saw one coming on the other side of the road and stepped out and I grabbed him by his coat and pulled him back just before he got run over so Jimmy nearly didn't go anywhere because he'd looked the wrong way. First thing he did, he'd looked the wrong way. And we went back to the Hyde Park Towers Hotel and sat in the lounge and we just sat around, we had drinks and everything else and that was it. We more or less, you know, became an item there, then and there. His relationship with Cathy Etchingham lasted for the next three years. The London that Jimmy landed in was a vibrant and self-confident place. Britain had come through the post-war hardships of the 50s, and by the mid-60s, the capital had become the world's hippest city. Jeff Barker is a music historian who spent his early 20s living in the British counterculture's epicentre. It was wonderful. When you got to the mid-60s, mid to late 60s, just being up there was great. You definitely thought there was an atmosphere. There were, there were the clubs, there were the gigs. We had things like uh, Middle Earth Club where you could go and see sort of psychedelic bands. If you were a folk fan, there were loads of great folk music venues like Les Cousin and others where you'd get people like Bert Yance and John Remborn. And the music was really the main, the key to it all. And, of course, people used to parade around and like to be seen. Mary Quant opened her first shop there, of course, Kensington Market in Kensington Church Street. All these places were where people just flocked to buy their horribly smelly Afghan coats, which everybody thought were dead cool at the time, and the, the sort of flared loon pants and all the psychedelic, all those tie-dye shirts. Blimey, how do they do that, you know? And that, that, so you definitely had a, a, an impression certainly living and working in West London and being adjacent to the West End, that it, was, it had changed, things were different. Gerard Mankovich was a young photographer working in London who'd chronicled the rise of the new music elite. He was a friend of Chaz Chandler's who asked him to come and take a look at his new signing. When I went down and saw him, uh, he was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, completely dynamic. I was absolutely amazed by his performance and knocked out by his appearance. I can't remember what he was wearing, but it was pretty flamboyant. And I'd heard that he had a reputation for being quite flamboyant and had, had come in for a lot of aggression in America and, and um, f f for his flamboyancy. Is that a word? But what I was amazed about was that 
I couldn't understand what he was doing. And what was amazing was that the other musicians couldn't really understand it. And that seemed to really strike me, that you saw these extraordinary guitarists, like Jeff Beck was there and Jimmy Page was there and Eric Clapton was there and Pete Townsend was there and endless great British rock musicians. And their sort of... Their mouths were open because not only were they amazed by what he was playing, but it was it was as though he'd completely rewritten the rule book as far as how to play the guitar. And I think that was what was most stunning. And then the other really extraordinary thing was that when I came to meet him, which was very briefly that evening, because you can imagine he was excited and there were endless people trying to say hello and Chaz said, you know, you've got to come and say hello to Jimmy and so I went and said hello to Jimmy and he called me sir and he stood up when I came to the table and, and, and you know, all I think I said was, you know, I really look forward to, to photographing you and we'll see you soon, I'll set something up. And they, yep, thank you very much, sir. And, you know, it was really, really weird. There's this quiet, spoken, ridiculously polite, very American young man. Swinging London was teeming with a new generation of cultural entrepreneurs, writers, photographers, designers, and, of course, musicians. Musicians were what London did best, the Beatles, the Who, the Stones, and a host of seemingly top-class guitarists, Jeff Beck, Pete Townsend, Jimmy Page, and, of course, God, otherwise known as Eric Clapton. In 1966, he was with Cream. They'd had three chart successes and were the counterculture supergroup. Hendrix was a big fan of Clapton's, and one of the promises he'd extracted from Chaz Chandler before they left New York was that he would get Jimmy on stage with Eric Clapton. Just over a week after Jimmy had arrived, Cream were playing at the London Polytechnic. It's possible that only Chaz Chandler would have had the persuasive skills to get one of the most revered bands in the country to allow a completely unknown guitarist on stage with them, Jack Bruce. It probably wasn't chance, but it seemed like chance at the time. I met Jimmy in, in a pub and uh, just opposite the gig, and uh, he asked to sit in, and I said, OK. And I took him, we went across, and Ginger wasn't too keen on him sit, sitting in. Surprise, surprise. Well, we went to um, this university do, and there was a stage there, it was quite high up, and we were standing on the left-hand side, there was Chaz, Lotta, myself and Jimmy. I was holding Jimmy's guitar case, uh, and I remember it quite well, because people kept banging into it and banging my leg. Anyway, Chaz went up and spoke to uh, Eric, who was leaning down over the stage, and Chaz was speaking up to him. And then he turned round and he spoke to the others, and then there was all this no and, and uh, yes, and then no. And then Chaz said something else, and eventually um, they said, yeah, all right then. But they didn't really want Jimmy to be playing in their gig because this was, you know, something special for them. Here's Eric Clapton. We came backstage and there was Jimmy, and he was really very already pretty freaky looking with big hair and all those Cossack jackets on and skin-tight jeans, but with these beautiful eyes and a beautiful voice and just a, a marvellous manner, a real kind of gentleman, a very soft, charming guy. And I just took one look at him and knew that there was something powerful going on, and uh, he got his guitar out and he said, would it be all right if he jammed? And I said, sure, yeah, if it's all right with the guys. And then Ginger was a bit, you know, I don't know about this. And Jack was all right. And Chaz, I remember, come, came back and said, yeah, yeah, you're on, you're on, get the guitar and you're on. But Ch uh, Lottie and I continued to stand where we were and Jimmy got on stage and, I mean, you could just see their faces were like, oh, good God, you know, what's this? <laughs> and he tore the place apart. He was playing the guitar with his teeth and, and you know, sort of behind his back and uh, we were sort of going, what, you know, what's going on? <laughs> Jimmy came on and stole the show. I mean, did his whole repertoire. He did uh, a Howling Wolf, a fast Howling Wolf song. Very powerful. And uh, he played the guitar behind his head, between his legs, with his teeth, slapped it around on the ground a bit, and I just went, yeah, this is it. You know, this guy is bound for glory. Jimmy got up on stage and absolutely wiped the face of the earth with Eric. Keith Oldham to the point that, he, that Eric put the guitar down and walked off stage. Chaz was then worried because he thought Eric was upset. 
right? And something had gone. So he said, I'd better go down and see him and disappeared from my side and went downstairs and came back about half an hour later. And I said, come on, tell me what happened. You know, he said, well, I went down there and Eric was sitting there with his head in his hands with a cigarette on. <laughs> and, I said, and I said to him, are you all right, Mum? You know, and Clapton said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, you didn't tell me he was that good, did you? <laughs> We all went away looking a bit smug. <laughs> so, and after that, I mean, there was this, there was a slight sort of thing between Eric Clapton and Jimmy. I don't care what anybody says, you know. They're kind of like gunslingers, you know, lead guitar players. In earlier days, the bebop days, when you get sort of uh, Wardell Gray and, and, you know, these sort of players who would try and shoot each other down in flames, there must have been a bit of that. But... I think once you got to know Jimmy, all of that went out the window because he was such a sweet guy. He wasn't competitive in that way. He only had good things to say about everybody. I never heard him say anything bad about any, anything personally. But maybe right at the beginning, there, there might have been a little bit of that. You would have to really ask Eric about that. There was certainly a, a, a demo that we did. Um, we were doing some demos like the, the next few days and, and there was a certain change of direction in Eric's playing. But no one else in the country would dare have gone on stage to jam with Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, and, and uh, Ginger Baker. They would have, you know, they would have died. Hendrix just strolls on, and, you know, it was a revelation. There are legion stories of the admiring and also the despairing kind of um, responses of some of these guitarists who really felt that they, you know, people like Pete Townsend, who felt that he was pushing the electronic aspect of things really well, Eric Clapton, who was obviously a, a real genius at simply sort of playing the blues licks. Here comes a guy who's doing, who's covering all of their bases and writing these amazing songs. I mean, you can imagine what it must have been like for some of these people. It's... You know, yes, they're in awe of him, but my God, it's like, oh, do we need this now? I mean, they because they really felt they were carrying the banner. They were taking the blues, they were reinventing the blues, and here comes a guy who's doing all of that and more. It's hard now to reconstruct the absolutely devastating impact that Jimi Hendrix had when he arrived in London in 1966. When I first heard Jimi Hendrix... It was a close thing between wanting to give up and wanting to try a lot harder. <laughs> it was a shock, you know, to, to see somebody like Hendrix. We were witnessing something really quite remarkable. I think that the London scene, if you can describe it as such, embraced him. I think the business embraced him. Chaz introduced Jimmy to every important band and musician in London and made sure they all heard him play. Pete Townsend. It was a strange time because, you know, the Who were, were just dabbling with a few kind of extremely arch pop ideas like the mini opera, which then later led up to Tommy. This was before the Beatles had produced Sgt. Pepper, or they were actually in the studio working on it at the time. But it was a shock, you know, to, to see somebody like Hendrix. We were witnessing something really quite remarkable. Charles Shaw Murray. There's a wonderful story about an early show that Hendrix played in Britain. Uh, the singer Terry Reid was in the toilet peeing next to Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones. And Brian Jones said, it's all wet in front of the stage. And Terry Reid said, oh, I've just been there, there's no water there. How, what do you mean? And Brian Jones said, from all the other guitarists crying. There was a fairly strict hierarchy in you know, the guitar league in Britain at that time. Hendrix arrived and within about a week of him showing up in this country, everybody in the pecking order had realised they had everybody had to move down one notch. When I first heard Jimi Hendrix, it was a close thing between wanting to give up and wanting to try a lot harder. <laughs> Brian May. I know Eric Eric Clapton has said something similar. You know, Eric was already a huge star and a wonderful accomplished musician by that time and he said that i mean i was big-headed enough to think that i was a good player by that point although i wasn't in any way successful i was still doing my studies because i went a different route really but Jimi hendrix just blew us all away i didn't want to believe how good he was i remember being played by a friend of mine somewhere in a flat somewhere near archway the flip side of hey joe which um which had Jimi hendrix kind of talking to the guitar and playing it at the same time and i thought oh it must be a trick you know he must have done it in the studio it's all you know it's been added on it's been overdubbed and then i went to see hendrix support the who and um hendrix came on with just one martial amp and it 
it, it blew up the whole time. It, it was a mess. All the equipment kept going wrong the whole night, but he was still blindingly good, and I could sense that the Who went on thinking, my God, we didn't think we had to follow that. <laughs> and I was a huge fan of the Who, and I still am. But um, Hendrix was just something out of the blue, and it was magic. Magic beyond belief. There was more dismay amongst London's musicians when the first album, Are You Experience, came out. Trevor Burton of The Move had had a preview. We'd done um, the enemy pop pole winners concert at Wembley Arena, and the Cream were on that day as well. And Eric and I had mutual friends whose birthday it was that night, and uh, we went to the speakeasy. And I'm sitting with Eric having a drink, and in walks Jimi Hendrix. So Eric calls him over and he said, here, Ollie, you've made an album. And he said, yeah, you know, do you want to come and hear it? So I went back with Eric Clapton and Jimi Hendrix to Jimmy's place and he played us the first album, the demo of the first album. And as our jaws dropped, <laughs> he just sat there, he sat there grinning. And it was quite an experience sitting there with Clapton and him and seeing Clap the look on Eric's face as well. Hearing it for the first time. As well, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were both gobsmacked, really, I think. I mean, the cream would do some pretty wild, wonderful things, but what Jimmy came through with, he was like a Martian landing, you know. <laughs> Listen to this, you know. Eric Clapton. I was very angry because he'd come here to England, we'd gone to America. And we were made, we made Israeli gears in America. Came back with de to deliver it, and no one wanted enough because they had. Are you experienced? And that's all anyone could talk about. You go to a club and say, Ah, oh, Jimmy's album. Have you heard Jimmy's album? No, I was furious. Robert Wyatt. What Hendrix did was he sort of took on the London Beat Group thing. What was going on around that time? and use that as the basis for taking British rock music away from the kind of pub rock thing. Uh, really took it into orbit. This is what surprised everybody, that he was a black American who wasn't like one of the founding father figures, not some lovable old git that we copied and changed, but he was a lovable new bloke that was copying and changing what we were doing, which was in the turn a version of what his older generation of black people had been doing. Glenn Tilbrook from Squeeze was and remains a huge Hendrix fan. <laughs> the last time I tried to emulate Jimi Hendrix, I think, was um, in the uh, Call for Cats video when I, I was under the impression that I was moving with a sort of feline sense of grace and looked sort of rock, rock goddish. Unfortunately, when I saw the video, I understood that I didn't have those qualities at all. There's this buffoon <laughs> Martini around holding his guitar up. But I, I had sort of used it as a phallic symbol at one point to push my way between these girls. It just looked totally ridiculous. <laughs> It was a crushing blow at the time, I can tell you. And he continues to inspire successive generations of British musicians. Glenn Tilbrook. I was in a situation in which uh, social services would definitely have been called in today um, when I was babysitting as a 12-year-old uh, for a 5-year-old <laughs> one evening. Um, and I remember watching Top of the Pops. This must have been just after he died and Voodoo Child got to number one. I'd been aware of Jimi Hendrix before, but uh, I hadn't heard that song. And the playing on it, uh, the, me, Glenn, 12 years old, thought that was amazing, absolutely amazing guitar playing. Being something of a guitarist myself by that time. And he became the first person as a guitarist who I wanted to try and sound like. And through Hendrix, I too went back and listened to some of the people that he, that he was... Uh, quoting as his influences, Albert King and B.B. King and people like that. And for me it's quite weird because I'm now saddled with that style and it's totally inappropriate to the sort of music that I play and I have to, I have to learn, uh, like uh, a lot of the solos I do, I have to learn because otherwise I just slip into bluesiness and unfortunately I'm not nearly as good as Jimi Hendrix so it's not really as enticing. Graham Coxon, guitarist from Blur. Well, he's extremely inspiring. It was just a little more wild, it had a lot more... Um jazz i think it wasn't just jimmy it was mitch mitchell as well and um it, it, it was a sort of a jazz influence i suppose and, and a lovely sort of swing which was sort of obliterated really by john bonham's forearms regretfully um 
and a, a sort of thuggishness. Uh, I mean, not thuggishness. I mean, John Bonham is an incredible player, but the swing kind of got lost somehow. And I think it was really important, especially if, 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 if uh, and I do talk about third stone from the sun quite a lot because I think as a piece of music, it's it's, it's really phenomenal. And uh, just the way it does go from sort of rock into this jazz, into, into free form. Whilst he was wowing London's rock legends, he was also putting together his own band. He wanted a big outfit, but eventually agreed with Chaz that a trio like Cream would be best. Noel Redding was a lead guitarist who'd played in The Loving Kind and The Lonely Ones and was looking for a job. I had a melody maker and uh, there was a thing saying there was an audition for Eric Burden and the new Animals as they'd just broken up. So I went down to this audition and played a bit of guitar I gather they'd already got a guitar player. At which point, Chaz Chandler came over to me. And Chaz, a big star, and I was 20 years old. And I'm sort of all awestruck. And he said, can you play bass? And I said, no, but I'll give it a go. He says, I'm skint, I'll try anything. So I lent them my bass, went down uh, to, a, I think it was a place called Birdland, where Jimmy was having a bit knocking around with a good... He actually was trying out amplifiers. And uh, Noel came down, used my bass, and we just said, right, that's him. We played three tunes with no vocals. And this American gentleman said, can I have a chat with you? So just next door to this place, which is just off German Street, there's this little pub. He asked me all about the English music scene, at which point that was like the move, the small faces, the Beatles, the Stones, etc., etc. And I asked him all about the American music scene, as I'd never been there. Has he ever seen Sam Cooke? And he said, I played with him. I said, oh, gee. And he said to me, he said, uh, will I join his group? And that was Mr Hendrix. <laughs> Chaz Chandler then asked John Mitch Mitchell to come down for an audition. He was a drummer who'd just left Georgie Fame's band. I just walked into this little basement in Soho and uh, very, very sort of dingy club, you know, in mid-afternoon, and there's a guy with pretty wild hair, but like a Burberry raincoat, you know, Sir Humphrey Bogart. Very quiet, very unassuming guy. I mentioned uh, bands like The Impressions to him, and immediately the guy knew the guitar style of Curtis Mayfield, and just, he went from one style to another very quickly, so I really knew that uh, he'd done his homework. You see, you had Noel Redding, who comes straight from the beat group tradition, the small faces, the move, that sort of thing, and with a total, how are you, Robert? You know, uh, total, just a lad in the modern sense, you'd recognise him, except for the long hair. Whereas Mitch Mitchell is a very sophisticated young jazz R&B drummer, and this uh, extremely loud guitar. Robert Wyatt rehearsed in the same room as Hendrix, and they became friends. He later went on to tour with the experience in America. Most excruciatingly embarrassing thing once, I was sort of fiddling around trying to write tunes on a guitar, and uh, he was sitting opposite, and, and he suggested an alternative fingering. He said, oh, you could do it that way unless you prefer the way you're doing. And I said, oh, no, I prefer the way I'm doing. And I thought, I just turned down a free guitar lesson from Jimi Hendrix. I felt such a twat. I don't know if you ever, you, everyone's too young to remember now, but when uh, films had been black and white and suddenly they went Technicolor, you know, you're quite used to the black and white and it's nice, but suddenly the room is filled with colour. Well, uh, that's what it's a bit like hearing Hendrix play. It was as if Technicolor had just been invented in a black and white world. In January 1967, the Jimi Hendrix Experience went into the studio to record their first album. The producer was Eddie Kramer. I remember very clearly the studio manager calling me down to the office and said, we've got this Jimi Hendrix chap coming in. <laughs> uh, and she said, um, well, you do all the weird stuff, so you do it. Because <laughs> I had a reputation for doing, you know, avant-garde jazz and um, literally the weird stuff. We were very fortunate. I think we were on the, at the vanguard of developing sounds. We had no prior ideas thrown at us. We were just thrust into it and we'd have to sort of make it up as we went along. There were none of the electronic devices uh, that we have today so we literally had three or four devices at our fingertips and that was tape delay, reverb uh, and some compression and, and obviously EQ, equalizers. 
And then we discovered uh, flanging or phasing. In fact, it was George Martin, because we asked him, how do you get that flange thing? And he said, well, you know, if you look in the BBC Radiophonics Handbook from 1949, you will find it there. <laughs> and this is a true fact. Um, he was most gracious in... in telling us how it's done but he was only doing it in mono uh, my assistant at the time George Kians, uh said well I think we can do this in stereo I said go for it go and experiment so he was experimenting away and he brought it into the studio one, one day with, with Jimmy and said Jimmy listen to this we, we got somebody we want to play you and this was the beginning of Axis Boulder's Love and we played the front part and then when it breaks into this huge drum solo Mitch is going boom boom chaka ka ba 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 boom and we put on the phasing the stereo phasing it was quite impressive Jimmy was so shocked he fell off the couch onto the floor and he was saying stop man this is great this is like my dream i've heard this in my dream man play it again play it again and he he wanted phasing on everything from that point on Chaz Chandler when we first take we ever went in the studio we had a, a terrific row because he was he had the guitar just so damn loud it was impossible to get it on tape you know and uh, we, had this, we had a big rousing row, but after that he turned the amp down. And uh, we got on very easy in the studio after that. But, um, the guy was such a great musician. He was um, incredibly particular in the sound. You know, those, those times when he would say to me, we can get a better sound than that. And I couldn't tell any difference between this, the new sound he put down and the one he put on. But, you know, he was saying, no, I'll, you know, it's not quite clean enough and all this. Recording Jimmy was always a, a, a wonderful experience. He brought to the table so many varying styles. It was jazz. If you really study it, you hear the double octave style of some of the contemporary jazz musicians. Obviously, the R&B funk uh, background. And then, of course, on top of that, you have this long-standing influenced by all the great blues players. But then, then there's the other aspect, and that is the Chaz Chandler influence, which is, you know, the pop sensibility of it being, you know, you, Jimmy, you've got to keep it to under three and a half minutes. I think Jimmy was forced into condensing this amazing talent into really highly polished little pieces. Chaz was largely instrumental in, in shaping that talent and, and bringing it to the fore and, and helping Jimmy express himself. Their first single went to number five, Hey Joe. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get our own particular sound, you know, like um, a freakish blues. This, you know, this rave, like almost only with a little more feeling than what's yeah. been happening lately. So, hey Joe isn't really representative of no, what you're trying to do? Yes, it's a phase, this one very small part of us. Robert Sandel. The way that albums were recorded changed quite dramatically um, because, of course, what Hendrix did in the studio was just play extraordinarily loud. And, and, the, and the recording engineers who tried to record it at first, they'd put the microphones close to these, um, these cabinets um, and everything, which all the, all the red lights would just sort of flash emergency. So what they had to do in order to get that sound was move the microphones to the other side of the studio. So effectively what you were doing was recording really loud music live, and that was an innovation in itself. No one really understood how to do that. If you listen to early recordings of bands like Cream, their studio albums sound really weedy compared to their live sound. And what Hendrix did and showed people how to do was to actually translate the power and the noise of live rock music onto record. He made his first two albums in London, Are You Experienced and Axis Boulder's Love, which was released in January 1968. Purple Haze, The Wind Cries Mary and Foxy Lady were all written over the course of a few months by someone who'd never composed anything before he arrived in Britain. The photographer, Gerard Mankovich, got to know Jimmy when he took the photographs that were to become iconic shots of the band in 67 and 68. I think that the London scene, if you can describe it as such, embraced him. I think the business embraced him. I mean, I don't know about individuals. I don't know whether Eric was pissed off about it or, or, or not. But I think they embraced him. Brian Jones was very enamoured with him and took him out shopping, introduced him to places like Granny Takes a Trip and Lord, Lord Kitchener's Valet and Portobello Road. And... But Jimmy already had a very highly developed individual and uh, flamboyant sense of style anyway, and he, he took to the look of the day, which was, you know, velvets and 
silks and satins and lace and chiffon and that all that look and he particularly loved the sort of military jackets that you could buy at Lord Kitchener's valet and the influence that that look was having on fashion and he had the perfect the perfect rock and roll figure because he was incredibly slim sort of hipless uh, and quite broad at the shoulders and had quite a big head which is quite an important and integral part of being a visually of being a rock star I found. I got the I got the impression that he was considered pretty eccentric in New York and I, I think that New York embraces eccentricity but basically doesn't support it if you know what I mean. I mean it, there are a lot of eccentrics in New York but they tend to be living on the streets or used to be or, or and, and, there, and there are a lot of in, eccentric individuals but they don't necessarily make it and I think his eccentricity, I think the fact that he was a black man wearing sort of wild shirts and, and, and tight trousers was probably seen as being quite threatening. Hendrix found London a lot less racially uptight and segregated than the US cities in which he'd lived. It was certainly not entirely devoid of racism, but a lot of the kind of crude racism he'd experienced in the States, he did not experience in London. Also in, in London he could move freely with white girlfriends in a way that was really difficult in parts of the States other than specifically liberated zones like, uh, like Greenwich Village. I think in London uh, when Hendrix arrived, you know, being black was actually an asset rather than a hindrance because the British musicians, despite the fact that there were a few racists amongst them, loved black music, were inspired by black music and sought to emulate. Eric Bibb is a blues guitarist who'd also made the trip from Greenwich Village to London in the mid-sixties. It was encouraging, that's the best word I can use, to come to England and see people who look more or less like me from Caribbean or African descent, people from uh, India and Africa with brown skins, you know, in the middle of mainstream London life was encouraging. I mean, I was used to America, which is a very special blend of integration and segregation. And um, to me, it was definitely much more of a world community than even the New York that I come from was. But Jimmy had a more universal and crucial cultural influence. He'd arrived in Britain in September 67, the summer of love on the west coast of America. Thousands of young Americans were descending on San Francisco in search of the hippie ideal. But there were mostly white Americans. Eric Bibb. He put um, a universal stamp on the whole hippie ethic. He gave it a face and an identity that wasn't simply Anglo or Caucasian. He was this guy who was clearly from an African-American background, you know, but he was really at home in a whole nother zone that translated uh, across all kinds of national and ethnic borders. Yeah, a black hippie who uh, was a great musician. It certainly gave me some encouragement because I was also in that situation where the whole hippie culture thing was uh, a part of my world and it was attractive. And we were all um, people who were like me from my kind of, uh, you know, background who were a little bit skeptical and leery of this very, you know, white kind of middle class reality. It just didn't really sit completely right, although it wasn't completely strange, it was familiar, but there was something that was not really embraceable completely. Kendricks, very early on, decided he was going to be a universal man, you know, and he really boldly claimed his space and in doing so really opened the door for so many people after him. Jimmy was a star in London's social scene and although he was living with Cathy Etchingham, he wasn't exactly monogamous. He liked London women and the feeling was mutual. He was incredibly attractive. I mean, and he was very, at the, in those early days, he was terribly charming and very humble and quiet and gentle and kind. And he did have a lovely sort of goofy-ish smile. And women thought he was the bee's knees. I mean, my God, that man could pull women, you know, I mean, without thinking about it. And lots of endless stories about him being in bed with 
endless number of women. I mean, it was, you know, impossible. <laughs> Robert Wyatt. Uh, what was nice was, and what I think that it's a thing that I haven't heard really said much about Hendrix was that he was he was quite effeminate and camp, you know, and his band were. And whereas I remember a friend of mine, Kevin Ayer, said in America, when the American men grew their hair long, they would immediately grow a beard to show they're still really men, and they'd unbutton their shirts to show they had hairy chests and so on. They were very nervous about this hermaphrodite thing that English pop music had brought to the world, and Hendrix reveled in it. And I think that women feel very comfortable, actually, with effeminate men. It's a paradox, you know. He was totally comfortable with women. He did not have what people think he must have had, which is a kind of mach macho posturing of his imitators. He was a gentle, witty, quiet man. I mean, he spoke in whispers. He was, I think, naturally an incredibly sexy person, but there's one thing that's really appealing about him is that he's obviously got a sense of humour about the whole thing, and that is what's so different to tons of other people who look like that or, you know, attempt to look like that. He can tell he's playing, you know, and that's a great thing. Having conquered Britain, Jimi Hendrix was due to return to the States in July 1967, and he knew how to leave in style. It was three days after the Beatles had released Sgt. Pepper when he played a farewell gig at the Savile Theatre owned by Brian Epstein. The Beatles were there, so was Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, Spencer Davis, all the upper echelons of London's rock society. And Hendrix opened with the Beatles' new album's title track. It's hard to imagine anyone else taking that kind of risk. Jeff Barker was also there. Well, the curtains opened, there was no sign of the band at all. All we could see was a wall of Marshall amplifiers, the biggest stack of amps, there must have been five or six high, and right across the stage, and Mitch Mitchell's drum kit, and another stack the other side for Noel Redding's bass. And that's the first thing we saw, this huge wall of amplifiers. And these sort of ripples of muttering started from people down the front where we thought, what is this? And then they walked on, Mitch Mitchell walked on. I always remember Mitch particularly had a blonde Afro uh, haircut which just sort of was wobbling around all over the place and he had a military jacket on and then Noel came on and then of course Jimmy came on looking like an absolute rainbow in his uh, red military jacket and that huge black frizz and just literally plugged in and they launched into Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the volume of which I'd never heard in my life before. And, but it was, it was just mind-blowing. I've never heard anything so loud but so impressive. The guitar playing was... I, I was agog. My mouth was on the floor. And we were up in the balcony. We thought, we thought the balcony was going to collapse because I'd never felt bass through the seat or through the feet, you know. Nine months after arriving in London, Hendrix returned to America to play at Monterey. America still hadn't heard of him. It was Paul McCartney who got him on the bill. In fact, the Jimi Hendrix experience was seen as part of the British contingent. But after Monterey, all that changed. His performance at that festival made him into an American superstar. But just three years later, he was dead. He'd moved back to New York, but died in London on the 18th of September 1970, having taken an accidental overdose of sleeping pills. The British producer, Eddie Kramer, was in America working on Jimmy's new album at the studio that he'd built in New York. My last contact, actually, he was in London, uh, and he was looking to make a big change. He wanted to get out of his management contract, and he wanted to put the original team back together. He had had a meeting with Chaz. Uh, he had called me up about a week before he died and said, hey, can you come on over and bring the tapes over? I said, Jimmy, we just finished <laughs> building Electric Lady Studios for you, and blah, blah, blah. And he said, uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll see you in a week. And that was it. He was looking to make a change, and he, I think he was trying to figure out a way to get me to bring the tapes over so he could work on them in England, but uh, that wasn't to be. If I had to just say musically on a scale of 1 to 10, I would say working with Jimi Hendrix is probably the most impressive time of my life. Uh, I thank God that I was able to be in the right place at the right time and, and I was really privileged to work with Jimi Hendrix. I mean it was a stroke of genius to bring him over here and if they hadn't you know Jimi Hendrix would not have happened it was definitely the recognition the instant recognition that he that he achieved here you know it was a revelation. <laughs> 